And the uh, topic of my uh, presentation is sustainable uh, content management systems, and I want to discuss how they contribute to or detract from web sustainability. And uh, since I've already been introduced, I'll skip over this. And the scope of the talk is to consider why content management systems are relevant to the issue of web sustainability and web UX. And I want to identify the issues that come up with content management systems and then finally introduce a sustainability framework for the web, uh, and particularly a strategy I call a green ingredient strategy. So first of all, I should point out what I mean by a CMS. I'm mostly going to be talking about open source CMS systems. Uh, specifically ones that allow non-developers uh, to integrate content into them and possibly do things like themes or plugins. And so because of that, I'm including mostly pub, uh, open source systems like WordPress and Drupal. I'm not talking about things like Google Docs and Django or Framework, uh, which are somewhat similar. So what's our motivation? I say, why well, worry about a CMS? And I will say the reason is that they rule the professional amateur web. And I'm going to move through these quickly, and you can see them later on. Uh, I'll put this up on SlideShare. But uh, the take home is WordPress is just incredibly dominant. If we look at um, traffic comparisons, WordPress has half the web. I mean, it's pretty amazing. The other two are in there are Joomla and Drupal. But it's extraordinary to the which uh, WordPress has ended up dominating this system. And so, it's even more dramatic if you look at the top million websites, which means ones with high traffic, and WordPress is still an enormously dominant system, as we can see here, and then the other two players are Joomla and Drupal. There are lots of proprietary content management systems, but they actually don't show up. They're like one thousandth of one percent. And if we even look at the vertical markets where we're building uh, things internally for companies, WordPress is still over forty percent of the total, so it's pretty incredible. Um, now, I want to put a point out for Drupal. Drupal actually is relevant even though it has low traffic because even though its low traffic is low, it generally is running on very high traffic websites. And this chart shows that even though there's a low install rate for Drupal, it has very high traffic. And e-commerce is relevant even though it only forms about 5% of the market uh, because it is a very resource and energy intensive system and right there, Magento dominates, and then comes WordPress yet again with WooCommerce. So I should also point out there are some CMS systems that have been promising to get rid of HTML and have us just design you know, in an authoring environment, kind of like Adobe Creative Suite, and they're minuscule. They're basically less 0.7% of the market, even if you include all of them. And these are things like Squarespace, Wix, and Weebly. And so I'm not going to consider them because they're such a tiny market share. Okay, so the next section is what do I mean by web sustainability? And I think it's more than a fast loading site. Uh, it's more than energy efficient, uh, would be semantic, re reusable, inclusive, and future friendly. Now, this type of design is going to consider the current needs of users and developers, best practice, so the methods we're doing don't prevent us from meeting those needs in the future, and then a strategy for making sure we don't degrade the internet in our work, so it's like our virtual ecosystem. So what are the features that affect it? Well, they differ, uh, CMS systems differ in features. Um, I put a big list here you can look at later, but I'm going to skip because we're running late. And I'm going to do that for this. Basically, I'll say that um, in terms of these systems, they're pretty good on certain things like taxonomy, except for WordPress. Uh, they are actually bad at web standards. A lot of them don't fully support HTML5 even now. They're pretty good at caching, but they do vary in how easy it is to learn. So that's an inclusiveness issue for in state sustainability. So WordPress is easy to learn. Drupal and Joomla are harder to learn. So how do they compare to their competitors? And I call these competitors client-heavy frameworks. And those are things like Angular and Ember that move all the logic onto the client instead of the server. So basically, you build the app on the client instead of trying to build on the server. And so if we compare here, we find that the client-heavy systems tend to have good standard support. Uh, they have the big issue that uh, because they're working on the client, the type of energy you're getting to run your system is less efficient than server-side bits. So now comparing the CMSs to themselves, 
WordPress is really slow. I mean, that's the conclusion here. It's an inefficient system, and it has to do with its very clumsy taxonomic system. And so all WordPress sites tend to be very slow and energy and resource intensive. In contrast, contrast Drupal is really good. It actually is pretty fast. The only things faster than Drupal are very small market share um, CMS systems that are proprietary, like HubSpot. And I have this list here. Now, how, because I'm considering sustainability beyond carbon, you know, let's say energy, how does the workflow affect things in terms of sustainability? Because in my opinion, if you get a workflow that's split into a waterfall, it's less sustainable than an agile or rapid design. And so I would say that WordPress, despite all of its faults, is pretty good in enabling a rapid design workflow, um, which fits a lot of sustainability criteria for small projects. And so just because it was a blog, it kind of supports collaboration. And the enormous numbers of themes means you can run all sorts of little design experiments very quickly by swapping themes. And having all those plugins and modules means you can do a paint by numbers website where you just push in not modules for function. And they could be refined later. Now, in contrast, if you use something like Drupal and also uh, Joomla, uh, there's a difficult learning curve and it really pushes things to the server side and you get a split between the server side developers and the front end developers and the designers. And that is a social disconnect and that's bad for sustainability. It means workflow is pushed into a waterfall model and it's less easy to maintain and update the website. And it, this problem is even more pronounced if you're using a framework like the Django, which hardly anyone would normally know in the design world, or Ruby on Rails, which really, really causes a split in your team to use these systems. Uh, but the problem is WordPress scales very poorly in large projects, and it's because it has a taxonomy that's been adapted for blogs, and people shoehorn or manipulate it so it can be pushed into these other areas, and so you need kludges and workarounds. Okay. Another question is access, and the question is how does the ability to use pre-built themes affect who can design for the web? And that's because I consider inclusiveness a big part of sustainability. And so having themes plus plugins really opens up the web so we don't have just professionals and a small elite designing the web, and that is good for sustainability. But the fact is if you have amateurization of this, you're reducing sustainability because people are putting up bloatware websites because they really don't understand what they're doing when they're developing a site in something like WordPress. The other issue of security is that the amateur web tends to be less secure and that lowers the sustainability of the web. It's almost a pollution of the virtual ecosystem. And so how do we measure web sustainability? And we need some rules that are unique to web sustainability, in my opinion. And how do you know? And I think it has to go beyond carbon footprints. So other industries have very well-developed frameworks, and I've listed a few here. The three R's most people are uh, familiar with, reduce, reuse, and recycle. Um, and I, there's some for graphic design, but I've listed two interesting books. Uh, the key feature here is these are not necessarily numeric. They mix qualitative as well as quantitative measures. Now, I'm taking my ideas here from a guy named Nate Shredoff, who's talked a lot about this. He wrote a great book called Design is the Problem. Uh, the future of design must be sustainable. And he has figured out some rules for extending sustainable framework thinking outside of industrial design or architecture. And so here I've listed his set of nine rules, the way I've abstracted them. And what we can see here is I've also listed how I think they apply to the actual functioning on the web. Now, I'm going to just go through them here in the interest of time and not go to the detail slides. So. Here we go. Uh, first of all, we need to make meaningful products or our website should have value and not be fluff. Uh, we need rollback, which means we need an agile design workflow. Um, we do need to be able to source renewable materials, and that could be, for example, switching to a green web host. We need to design our products to work in the future, which means we need web standards and perhaps also classic visual design techniques to make it future friendly. We need to design with the user in mind, and that's the UX element, which is a big part of this conference. But we also need what I consider democratic access, not just to the site, but to the creative process. And that would be accessible, responsive, and also designer-friendly uh, creation of the websites. Now, we need standards-based design because that makes our sites modular, and we get interchangeable parts. 
Um, we do need to minimize energy consumption, and that would be like web performance optimization. And finally, we don't want to screw up the web as a whole. And really, I think that's where we do effective search engine optimization, or SEO. OK, so I'm going to move past the score system quickly, because my feeling is that we just won't have enough time to do this. So I'm going to move past my details here. And I'm going to end up here talking about what I call a green ingredients framework because I've introduced the idea that CMS systems are very important to sustainability, and its sustainability isn't just about carbon footprints. It includes things like user experience, but many of those things are qualitative. So how do you handle something that's qualitative, and how do you score it, and how do you introduce it into your design workflow if I start a big project with WordPress or uh, Joomla or something like that? And so we need to be able to measure sustainability and still use qualitative factors. We can't just go by a carbon footprint. It's way too difficult. And the reason it's too difficult is we don't have all the numbers. Now, if you look at other industries, they have numbers because they have these exhaustive analyses called life cycle analyses. And for us to do this on the web, we would just have to take an extraordinary amount of effort. And we just don't have all those numbers yet. We would need to figure out the office energy of the development, uh, we need to do performance calculations for all the browsers. We need to check out all the server calculations of energy efficiency. But then we need to check out the local utilities. Uh, and then we need numbers for things like modularity of design and access. And we just don't really have a criteria for doing that. So how do we introduce sustainability when we're trying to develop a CMS? Well, I'm going to say we can use a technique called the green ingredients technique. And that allows for qualitative scoring. And that would be software for UX, UI, workflow changes, and appropriate design strategies. And so here's how we do it. And I call this the Ouroboros strategy. You create a database, and you list these things we'll call green ingredients, which are basically your techniques for design and development. And you score the presence or absence of these things in your project. And then you're, rather than trying to calculate numbers, you swap greener ingredients out for less green ingredients. Now, if you can quantify, you do, but otherwise, you just list swaps. And so I have a link up in here showing where I've uh, gone through the strategy of my own site. And so basically, you need to create this table, swap the ingredients, score it in a non-numerical way unless you have numbers. And then if you have quantitative tests that you can do, you can put all of this next to the quantitative test. And so the advantages are we don't need a lot of calculation to figure out if we're making good sustainability choices. Uh, sustainable progress can be detailed in terms of design choices instead of just numbers, which are more understandable. And that means we can create visual deliverables that we can show our stakeholders in the design and development process. And so for my last two slides, I have an example of just building a little matrix like this, a hypothetical one for content management systems. And here I've listed what I mean by green ingredients, which are aspects of design and workflow, software libraries, uh, techniques, where we host in the cloud, uh, whether or not we've got uh, updates on the site, whether or not we have good SEO, uh, search engine optimization, uh, whether or not the design is flexible within the CMS, and whether it's scalable. And in many cases, because we don't have numbers, I just scored up or down. And then if I do have a number, I've scored a number. Now, the result is I've created a chart that we can all look at in the design team and the stakeholders and decide if we're on a sustainable course. So this might be the way we would choose our CMS. Then my last slide here shows um, an idea that once we're starting on a project, we can use this green ingredients strategy and compare it. So I have two scores up here, uh, web page test and eco grader. And what I'm showing here is Basically, as I introduce uh, green ingredients, which would be things like uh, improving SEO or putting in a cache um, or changing uh, my web host to a greener host, we can also have it running against these things like EcoGrader or web page test and then score it. And once again, we have a deliverable that we can use to advance the sustainability process with everyone in the design and development team. So I'll just summarize and say, CMS systems are important. They have features that can improve sustainability. Um, considering sustainability requires a framework, and we need to go beyond carbon footprints to make people start doing this. And the green ingredient strategy would let us start in CMS-based projects and include qual qualitative features of sustainability. 
And with that, I guess I will end my slideshow. And let me just pop back here. Okay, so back to you guys, James.